So we're, we're on the connection design uh, topic in the um, in this. So we've, we've already done introduction to structural engineering. Uh, we've looked at members' intention. We've looked at members' in compression. We've looked at flexural members and those beams. And now we're looking at how we connect the members together. So we're looking at both um, both connections, like here, and while, while the connections like up here. Okay, so an overview of what we're going to cover. Uh, first, look at the context, um, then introduce the different types of connections, design procedure for bolted connections. I will do a worked example of bolted connections, I look at welded connections, and a worked example of welded connections. So that's what that's what we're going to cover as part of this part of the um, course. We try and put this in context. Uh, so what we've done is we've designed a beam already. So a beam is a member uh, spanning between two supports, two or more supports. So in this case, it's two supports. It actually, it can be just one support, which is a fixed support. Um, so it's got a span. Uh, it's got a load on, on top of it. And uh, with that design in that beam that we've just um, spent some time at last week and the week before, designing that beam is just one aspect of that the structural engineer can, needs to consider. So we have a load. It's coming onto the beam from somewhere, so that load can be coming down through a column. Into the beam, we need to get that beam, that load, safely down through in, through um, some supports, uh, which might be a, down through a, a, a column and then into the ground. It might be into a wall. Uh, the beam might be sitting directly onto a foundation. We have to safely get the load from the end of the beam into the ground safely. Okay, so we have to be able to transfer that load. Uh, into it. So that we need to consider that in our design. So we've been uh, last week we were looking at loading uh, and maintaining a factor design load through say load takedowns or load safety factors and combinations. So last week the load was coming from flooring to one beam and then for example in, into another beam. Uh, as I said it could also come from a column so we might have to work out all the loads from the floor above maybe a floor above here, that goes down to a column, and then into this uh, beam here. So we have to do a load takedown to take into account all of the loads that are being transferred through this element uh, into the beam. We then need to make sure we put uh, safety factors on those. So every load that's a dead load, which is a, which is a permanent in location and magnitude, we factor that up by 1.35. All of the imposed loads, which are variable in magnitude and uh, potentially location, uh, we factor those up by 1.35 or 1.5 uh, in there to get our load combination. Okay, so we covered that uh, last week and, and earlier on. Then we have our support conditions. So a provision of beam supports through connection design. So we could have a pinned a bit, uh, a pinned uh, joint, uh, like on the left hand side here. It effectively means that this member I can freely rotate it at the end of it. So there's no restraint to stop that from rotating. So I can freely rotate at the end. We could have a roller joint, like in this case, as well as being able to freely rotate. Uh, it also is able to move uh, left and right on the page here. And uh, we can have a fixed uh, joint. So if one of these was a fixed joint, it means that the angle that is at the unloaded angle remains the same afterwards. In other words, this wouldn't stay flat or horizontal at A, uh, and then the bending down would start to happen out here somewhere else. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a fixed uh, joint. We can have a bolted connection, so we can use bolts to bolt things together, or we can have a welded connection where we weld it all together. So that's what uh, we're going to concentrate on uh, this part of the course. So the design engineer requires all three pieces of the puzzles for, for design. So designing, uh, we need to be able to work out uh, accurately the loading, uh, put on factors of safety and the load combinations. We need to be able to uh, safely design and accurately design at the beam to be able to make sure that's strong enough um, to carry all the loads. We need to be able to pass those loads safely to the connections at the end as well, so to be able to design those connections uh, in there. So it's a responsibility of the structure engineer uh, to be able to design all those elements. So when do we connect uh, steel structures together? Well, we have a change of direction. So for example, we have uh, at the start here, we have a, a beam, a horizontal element, and that's going into a vertical element. So the horizontal element being the beam, uh, we then transfer the load from the end of the beam to the reaction. So through the shear at the end of the beam, it needs to go through these bolts first. Then from the bolts, it goes into this um, plate. Um, 
this uh, gusset plate or yeah, uh, fin plate, sorry, this fin plate at the end. Um, that fin plate in this case is welded onto the front face of the column. Uh, so this is the column here. And so the load transfers through the bolts, from the bolts through the plate, from the plate through the weld, from the weld through the column, and then from the column down into the ground. Uh, it might even be a base plate at the bottom and into the ground. So as a structural engineer, I need to make sure that the beam is safe. In other words, that the demand load on the beam divided by the capacity of the beam is less than one. So in other words, that the demand is smaller than the capacity. So that's the first check. Then I need to make sure that the bolts are adequate to pass all those shear loads uh, in shear forces through. So I check the bolts for the capacity of the bolts. Uh, if the bolts are safe, then I check the um, capacity of the plate to be able to transfer the load through. If the plate is adequate, then I check the capacity of the um, wells. And if the wells are adequate, then I check the capacity of the column to take the load. Okay, so all of these little individual elements uh, we have to design as a structural engineer. And the downfall of a lot of structural engineers is they forget to check everything. They say, oh yeah, the beam is fine, and then they just assume that the, that the connection is going to be fine. And then next thing, a weld breaks or that. So it's important to look at the load and follow the load all the way through to see where it's going to go in, in, into the building. Uh, in the case here, the middle case, and it's uh, where you have a, a beam that then is coming into another beam. So it's a change in direction in, in the horizontal direction. Okay, so we have a load coming in off this beam and then it's going into the other beam in here. So again, we have a fin plate here that's uh, welded onto the web of this uh, larger beam and it's bolted into the web of this uh, smaller beam. In something like a roof truss, or like what you're going to design, um, you've got a a, um, a a member here, so this is the top cord, bottom cord of it, some other internal members in the truss. I need to connect all of those together. So we have a splice plate uh, there, and then lots of different uh, bolts going through. So the number of bolts are going to be dictated by the size of the force uh, in this member. So if this member is in tension, then that load has to be transferred into the plate to, in this case, three individual bolts. So we have to design, make sure those bolts are adequate. If you remember the in the tension design um, example, we looked at the gross cross section area out here. We worked out the tensile capacity based on that, and then at the connection we worked out what the net cross section area is, and we worked out the capacity there. And the overall capacity of the section is whichever is smaller, uh, based on the gross cross section area out here or the net cross section area at the connection. Okay. So that's um, so. So that's when connections occur. So if we have a change in direction, uh, that's one aspect. Another aspect where we might have connections if we want to make the steel more manageable so that we can transport it or we can erect it uh, in there. So um, to an Arctic truck, like an Arctic trailer is 12 meters in length. So it therefore wouldn't typically have a steel members more than 12 meters in length because otherwise they're hanging off the back of the Arctic trailer. Uh, and uh, now sometimes you have them a bit longer, maybe up to 16 meters, but that would be about it. Um, so 12 meters is kind of the limit usually that we apply for the length of a member. So if I had a, a column stack in a building, I was going up the height of the building, or even a beam, uh, sometimes it could be a span uh, more than 12 meters that I need, or an overall height more than 12 meters. So in that case, we end up putting a splice uh, in there. So it could be a, a splice where we have water connections, down through like this, so we put a we weld on a, an in plate onto the column, we weld an in plate onto the other column below, and then we bolt them uh, both together. We can also have a, a welded one, so this is a, a welded connection, so you have one column, another column, and they're welded uh, together here. So in this case, the type of weld here is a full penetration butt weld, uh, where there's a, there's a little um, a wedge shape uh, taken from the end of one steel, wedge shape cut from the other steel, uh, and then they, they, they touch uh, in a small area here, and then they fill in in between with weld on both sides. So that weld makes the um, connection as strong, if not stronger, than the, than the primary material or the parent material of the column. Okay, so if you do a weld like this, the assumption is then that the weld is at least as strong as the column that it's connected to. Uh, sometimes we might have a say, we might be changing the size of a, a column from a larger one below and a smaller one above it. And you can see then that the flange here and the flange at the top one, there's a little step in. So here there's a little step in, that's the thickness of the flange at the bottom one, thickness of the flange, flange at the top one, there's a little step in. And that allows us to get a little fillet weld 
uh, along here. So fill it well along the edge of it and fill it well on the other side as well. And you can end up having a, 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 a partial um, penetration weld as well uh, on the other side. If uh, if you locate the top column, if it happens to be a top column or a place in the middle, you can obviously get a fillet weld on, on both sides. Okay, so another place where we might have a connection uh, is where um, the change of a component occurs. So if we have a column up to a building, uh, and we take this, this column here on the lower floor, that column is carrying all the load from the roof, from this uh, third floor comes down to the column, the load from the second floor comes down to the column, the load from the first floor comes down to the column, uh, and then that goes down into the into the foundation. So we, we would need a larger column typically, say, from ground to first floor, compared to, let's say, from third floor up to roof, because there's only one floor carried on the column. Uh, the load from one floor has been carried from the column uh, from third floor to roof, whereas on the the ground floor to first floor, there's three floors of the uh, of the load being carried. Okay, so you might want to change the size of the column going up through, so therefore put a connection uh, in there, uh, like in here. Also, as the column goes uh, down into the foundation, so the concrete foundation below, uh, we would use uh, typically holding down bolts, so there's holding down bolts there. Uh, there is a base plate that's welded onto the column, uh, and then this is a grout that's put underneath it to make sure it's perfectly uh, um, level as well, so that we have a vertical uh, column uh, in there. We can classify the connections. So there's really three classifications of the connections. There's a simple connection, there's a rigid connection, and then there's a semi-rigid connection. So a simple connection is effectively a pin support. In other words, we can assume that there's no resistance to rotation at the end of the beam. So we can freely rotate the, the beam uh, at, the, at the end of it. So there's, uh, there's it just uh, takes no effort whatsoever to rotate the end of the beam. So there's no, no, no resistance to rotation. That's a simple connection uh, in there. So these are some examples, uh, real world examples of, of that type of connection. Uh, so we can have uh, L plates uh, coming on here where it's, where it's bolted into the web on the larger uh, beam, bolted into the web with the smaller beam. Uh, and that is assuming that there's no um, that there's no resistance to rotation. Why? Well, because most of the uh, the moments have been resisted by uh, the forces go into the bottom flange and into the top flange, and then these aren't touching the column here, okay, or not touching the beam on the other side. So there's a gap. So it's very important to have a gap between the end of your beam and the face of the column. There's a gap there. So as it rotates around, then there's still a gap there. So the bottom flange isn't pushing in against the column. Uh, so therefore, you have nothing to resist that to stop it from rotating around. The same thing, there's no connection at the, from the top flange uh, into the column. So the only connection is down to the web uh, in there. And this, this closer that those three bolts are together, uh, then the less resistance there is to, to rotation. So we can assume that that's a, a pin connection. Obviously, there's going to be some sort of uh, resistance to rotation, but not a huge amount of resistance to rotation. That's an elevation, the plan view of what you're seeing over here in the uh, in the 3D in the 3D version, and there's different versions of the, of this. But effectively, usually, if you don't connect the flanges um, of the beam into a column or into another beam or into a wall, uh, then you can assume that it's a um, simple connection that it can uh, can freely rotate, no resistance to moment. Whereas a rigid connection, so if there's a beam uh, coming in here into an into a column, a rigid connection, you can see there's a full extended in plate uh, onto the beam. So this is an extended in plate uh, on the beam. And then we bolt that in. If I try and uh, rotate this around, so if I stand on the end of this beam here, try and rotate it around, um, the load in the bottom flange is pushing in the way towards the column. The ones in the top flange is pulling out the way. Uh, but I can see it can't pull out easily because there's a bolt just below it, a bolt just above it. Uh, so therefore, that's going to be a rigid connection. Whereas on the bottom, it can't push in easily because it's got a full uh, plate here to push, push against it. So that's going to give me a rigid connection. And you can see what that looks like in elevation over here, where you can see that the top flange where it's um, horizontal, the beginning, bottom flange where it remains horizontal, and then it starts to deflect down uh, further out away from it. Whereas in the simple connection, uh, you can see that there's uh, free to rotate at the bottom and free to rotate at the top. Yeah, John, have you a question? <laughs> 
So there's a hand up there. Is that on purpose or not? Have you a question, John? No, maybe. Okay. Um, so that's a rigid connection. So a rigid connection basically gives us rotational stiffness, uh, and it's very the rotational stiffness is very high at the end of the beam. Uh, in there, so basically no rotation relative to um, the column at the joint. Um, so in other words, that the rotational stiffness, the stiffness of the connection here is at least as big as the stiffness of the beam itself. So therefore, we can see it's it's a, a rigid connection, and therefore we can pass moments through the end of it. Whereas a pin connection, there's no moments gets passed through it. Moment is always zero. And a pin connection, where it's a rigid connection, uh, we've got it's a, we've got a full full moment in there. And then the third um, definition we can have: so we have simple connections with no moment in it. Uh, we have a rigid connection where we can have a moment transferred through it. And then a semi-rigid connection, which is somewhere in between, where it doesn't have full rigidity. In other words, the stiffness of the connection is somewhat less than the stiffness of the of the beam. Okay, so we have a, a full in this one here. If we look at moment against rotation. Uh, we have full rigidity here in, uh, in, in this graph in the top one, type 3. We have no rigidity um, in type 1 or very, very low rigidity in type 1, uh, whereas in type 2, it's somewhere in between. Okay, We have some sort of stiffness um, in there, so stiffness being the relationship between moment and rotation. We have some sort of stiffness there uh, in the semi-rigid connection, uh, but it's lower than the full uh, stiffness that we could achieve with a fully rigid connection and it's not quite as low as a pen connection in there. Okay, so we can see here some deformation of that in place in there. So you can see some uh, local deformation here in there because we haven't got full rigidity uh, in there. Okay, so that's outside the scope of this course, but just to be aware of it, semi-rigid connections uh, in there. So then how do we form these connections? So I suppose there's two major types of um, um, tools for our disposal. One is welded connections and the other is bolted connections. Okay, so these are welded connections. So you can have a plate uh, here. So on the right hand side, we have one plate, we have another plate coming in together, and they want to be joined together. So we take a chamfer off one plate, a chamfer off the other plate, and it leaves a V in between them. And then you can fill that with weld uh, in there. So the weld material effectively, what it will do is it will uh, melt or it will uh, eat the plate materials, which then gets mixed with the weld material uh, in there to create a um, strong joint in between. So that's called a butt weld uh, in there. So that's one way of doing it. Another way to weld uh, two pieces together is you have a plate on the bottom here and you have a, and another plate is coming in at 90 degrees to it, perpendicular to it. So they're meeting together, uh, one just left on top of the other, and then you run a weld all the way on the side. That's the easiest weld to make uh, out of all the welds. And that's uh, that's a fillet weld in there, okay? Because you can see it's creating a fillet. So if we look at a section of it, uh, on those bottom ones there, you have uh, the bottom plate, you have another plate that's perpendicular to it, uh, and then you have a, a fillet weld that's connecting those two members together, which is shown in yellow in the examples there. So you have different joint types. You have a T-joint where you have one plate that's perpendicular to the other plate. You have a lap joint uh, where you have um, uh, where you have two plates on top of each other uh, and uh, in the same direction and you fill in the, the, the corner. Uh, and then you have a corner joint where you have two plates which are um, again perpendicular to each other, uh, but they're offset and you can fill in uh, in between them. So I wouldn't typically be using the corner joint. It's very hard to create uh, in there. Very hard to get good, good quality in there. Whereas something like this, like the T joint um, in there would be um, a lot easier to create. Okay, so fillet welds are normally preferred as it requires only simple preparation of the joint. Effectively, once you have a flat end uh, on one plate, on the other plate, you can just put them together. And uh, normally, what we do is we tack weld them. So we put little welds, short welds on different places on one side. Uh, so kind of hit and miss. So a little short weld there, a little short weld on the other side, short weld here, short weld on the other side. Kind of tack weld them together um, to make sure they're in place, make sure everything is, is, uh, is, is vertical and, and so on. Um, and that it doesn't get warped, and then we then start to run the weld uh, along. So welding process means you're going to heat up uh, the uh, steel. So as we weld along here, it means that we're we're adding new material, which is the weld material. But it's also melting the parent material in there as well. So you can see here uh, that there's some parent material as well that's melted, and all that solidifies in in together. If we just weld it all the way along one side, 
uh, without doing the other side, then you will end up getting warping into, into this because if you heat up one side of a metal and don't heat up the other side, the heated side wants to expand, the other side stays where it is. And if you expand one side, the other side wants to stay where it is, it will end up um, bending or warping over. So you have to be very careful in terms of welding, how you do it, uh, to try and minimize uh, any warping that will happen. And to make sure that the quality of weld is good um, in there. The quality control of uh, welded connections are particularly difficult because of the defects below the surface that you can't see, and even minor flaws at the surface will escape visual detection. So because of the, the um, you can't see it with the naked eye, uh, then we have to have some sort of um, special techniques to use, like radiography or ultrasonic testing that's going to be used. And that's called non-destructive testing. In other words, we want to know if the weld is of good enough quality without destroying um, the sample without destroying the steel or having to pull it apart. And how you do that is you can do an ultrasonic test in it or radiography, uh, which will show if there's any you know, um, micro cracks inside it or any defects uh, in there. Or there's some sort of um, strain material that has got in there, dirt or other kind of um, strain material that's got into the weld during the welding process. So that's one of the main drawbacks of on site welded connections because it's very hard. Um, to control the quality on site, you know, it might be raining, uh, cold, not the right temperatures. You guys are working in pretty tough conditions outside. Whereas if you have welded connections that are done within the factory, it's a far more better controlled environment. So we really try to avoid welded connections on site, um, and we do all the welding in the factory, uh, in the fabrication uh, house, uh, rather than uh, on site. Okay. That's uh, that's well the connection. So normally on site, what we do is we bolt members together. So in this example down here, we have a column, uh, a vertical column here, and then you see there's a plate. Uh, there's a fin plate uh, connected to the column. So that fin plate is welded to the column. So what would be delivered to site from the factory would be the column plus uh, the fin plate welded onto it together. So that would come with the little um, plates hanging out the sides of it and uh, delivered to our site. The beam would also be delivered to site. That beam already would have holes punched into it. So the three holes pull, punched or drilled into it uh, for the three bolts um, that are going to connect it together. So on the back of the lorry, we have a vertical member here, which is the column that already has these um, plates welded onto it, the fin plates welded onto it. On the lorry, we also have the individual beams uh, where, that have holes already pre-drilled into it. And then they are lifted into place on site and an operative on site then puts the bolts uh, in there to connect them all together. So puts the bolts in, the nuts then onto it and tightens it all up, up together. Okay. So depending on the shape of the connection, the bolts could be loaded in tension, shear, or combination of shear and tension. So in the example here on the left-hand side, all bolts are predominantly in shear. Okay. So if we think of the beam, if I'm standing on top of the beam here, right on, on top of it, most of my load is transferring into the uh, through the beam uh, through shear, and then into the column. Or even if I stand in on the middle, half of my load goes uh, into this side through reaction, half of my load goes into the other side through reaction. Right there. So that reaction goes through those um, bolts uh, as a shear force through the bolts. So it tries to shear those bolts uh, off and then tries to shear the plate off, tries to shear the, um, the um, weld off and then into the, into the column. So that's predominantly in shear, those bolts. They might have a little bit of tension in them, but that's predominantly shear. Whereas on the um, example on the right hand side here, I stand on the end of the of the beam. So if I'm jumping up and down on the end of the beam here, I stand in the beam. The uh, top flange of that beam uh, wants to stretch out, and the bottom flange uh, wants to go in. There. Okay, so this is a uh, so this top flange here right on the end of it wants to head off down here. Bottom flange going off down here. Okay. So that, what's that mean? Well, that means that this, uh, I'm effectively putting a tension force on the top, on the, put that on the top. So it might be easier if I do it this way. So I'm putting a tension force on the top, and then I'm putting a compression load uh, on the bottom. Okay. So that means each of these little uh, individual bolts then, be some sort of a tension force coming out. Next one's going to be a little bit lower of tension force. And even a lower one on the bottom. Okay, so it's the bolts, the ones at the very top will have the highest um, the bolts at the top will have the highest tension force, next one's the next tension force, next one's the next one uh, down through. So the, the amount of force 
kind of balls would vary as I go down through. And effectively, what you end up doing, look at a diagram like that. I'll have the top bolt bigger, next bolt a little bit smaller, and the next bolt a little bit smaller. Okay, so then in that connection, what we can do is we can uh, calculate then what the total resistance is, assuming that there's a linear distribution of load from the compression part up to each of the different tension uh, parts of it. And so we have a bigger force in the top bolt, smaller in the next one, and smaller in the next one there. We add in the resistance of each of these three bolts, multiply it by two because I have another set on the other side. Um, that would give me the overall tension resistance. If I want to know what the bending resistance is, well, if I stand on the bottom, you know, force times distance uh, is um, the resistance. So I'm standing on the bottom. This first one has a has a distance up. Uh, you know, so let's say if I that's oh, let's say that's the lever arm. The first bolt line is there. Second bolt line is there. Third bolt line is there. Okay, so I have uh, I have a height here. H1. I have a height here. H2, I'll have a height at the very top, H3. Then I have a, a resistance of a bolt at 3, resistance of a bolt 2, and resistance of a bolt 1. Okay. Then I know that moment is force times distance. Okay, so the moment, sorry, it's the sum of the forces times the distance. So that moment is equal to F1 times H1 plus F2 times H2 plus F3 times H3. Okay, so in that case, uh, on that right hand side, I have all the balls in, um, in tension uh, in there, some of them, so, so that I can work out what the moment resistance is of, of that one. Uh, in the one on this side here, I've got a shear demand at the end, and then that's going to go into a shear into each of these individual individual bolts okay so that's a shear and effectively you know the overall shear force of the bolts is equal to the sum of the shear force for each individual bolt whereas i is equal to one to the total number of bolts okay so if i have three bolts eg fvb is equal to three times f uh, v v1 okay because they're all the same all the same bolts Okay, so that's um, um, so that so that so in this, these two examples, we have some bolts in tension, we have other bolts probably in in, in shear. Um, so the the bolt that connects tend to be utilised on sites has better quality control and faster assembly. So it's you know, pretty fast to assemble the different elements together. The cost of a steel structure, if we take the overall cost of a steel structure, take the material uh, of the steel structure. So that's been material that's used in the columns and the beams bolts to connections and so on that's about 20 to 40 percent of the overall cost uh, of the of the um of the structure whereas the fabrication which is the making of it so the welding together the punching of the holes and so on the reaction the erection which is uh, assembling together on site the production of the drawings so somebody has to do the drawings and the design uh, and so on so the design element the protection so in this case it looks like it's galvanized uh, steel uh, because it's exposed to the um, air Maybe it's exposed to, to um, saline water, so to um, the air. So in Galway, we're very close to the sea. I mean, very close to the sea means there's a lot of moisture in the air, but not only moisture in the air, moisture that has um, some salts in it from the from the sea air, and that can that can uh, corrode a seal very easily. So you might want to uh, make sure your paint spec is good enough so that the so that uh, moisture, the salt, the saline solution. And air don't get in towards the steel and uh, rust the steel so, or else you could galvanize it like in this case okay so the fabrication erection drawings protection and design could be between 60 and 80 percent um when i was working in industry when i would work as a structural engineer i would design up all the primary members uh, first so the, the the beams the columns and so on and then I, I in my design i have to make some assumptions so if i'm designing this beam i have to assume whether it's a pinned or a fixed connection in my design so my structural analysis early on i need to design decide what type of connection i'm going to have because that's going to change what the bend the moment diagram is uh, for the beam for example so if i assume it's a simple connection like in this case and then i have to make sure that i've transferred that through into the drawings 
uh, later on, that it is a simple connection, not a rigid connection, because that is what I've assumed in my design. So I would design that uh, as beam, I would design the columns and so on. I know um, how much the beam weighs, because whatever section I pick, then that will tell me how many kgs it is per meter length, uh, and the same with the column. And then I will add up all of the total weight of every beam I have, the total weight of every column I have, and I will then multiply that usually by 10%. And 10% will take into account all the other material that I have for the, uh, uh, for the bolts and, and, and the connections. That's the, that's the mass of steel I will use to multiply by the rate it costs me to buy steel. So steel could be maybe, structural steel like this could be something like maybe between 2 and 2 euro 40 per kg. So every kg of material I use could be 2 euro or 2 euro 40 uh, in there. That's how I know then how much the, the building is going to cost. So every time I can shave off a kg of material, then I could potentially save two euro or two euro fifty. However, I have to be careful because every kg I shave off is off the material side, whereas all the other stuff, fabrication, erection, drawing, protection and design, all take a, you know, a significant more amount of money. So I have to be careful that I don't spend too much time trying to shave a few kgs off and then I've, I've blown all that uh, saving by um, the cost of the extra cost of me doing the design. However, um, I also um, have to be careful if I could shave some uh, time off by say changing this into a welded connection or into a full uh, in connection. And that could take longer to, uh, to erect it on site or make it more difficult to erect it on site or more difficult to fabricate it. And therefore, even though I might save a few kgs of material, I might have increased the overall cost because I've increased the complexity in it. So we want to make everything as simple as possible, as easy as possible to construct it, so that there's less chance that they're going to make mistakes on, on site afterwards. But as a structural engineer, I need to always keep my utilization ratio as close to one as possible, so that the demand is very close to the capacity, and therefore I'm getting more and more closer to optimizing my uh, structural design. I'm not wasting money, I'm not wasting material, which has got every the material we use has obviously got an environmental impact. So the more that, uh, savings we can wait, make on the material we use, we're also not just saving on cost, but also saving on the environmental impact as well. Uh, connection design can have a significant influence on the building cost. As I said, if I if I make a simple connection like this, usually I will when I'm pricing it up, price up the um, based on all of the steel, the primary steel I have, and multiply that by 10% to take into account uh, the cost associated with uh, the connections. Whereas if it's more complicated connections, like rigid connections, then I would increase it by 20% rather than 10%. Uh, so effectively around 10% more expensive to put rigid connections in there. But you could get the savings in terms of the weight of the primary material and it could pay itself off. What standards and text should we use? Well, we're designing everything according to the Euro codes. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, Euro codes at three, EN 1993 is our structural steel design. And then part one, part eight is specifically for connections. So we're going to take the guidance uh, for our connections uh, design that we're going to do in the examples uh, from Euro code three, uh, part one, part eight. This is the best book uh, I found anyway in terms of designing um, steel structures and in particular connections as well. It's the behavior and design of steel structures to Euro code three. Uh, it's from some of the uh, academics over in Imperial College and other places. Um, and it's a, it's a really good book. So I think you can probably get that online. And chapter nine has the, has the connections. So a little bit more detail then on, on the connections. So we have the design of the bolt connections. Um, the bolts come in a number of different grades, uh, which are representative of strength. So when we go to table 3.1 in Eurocode 3, uh, part one, part eight, it gives us the nominal values um, for the strength of the bolt. So FYB is the yield strength of the bolt. And the ultimate strength of the bolt is FUB. So if I take a bolt that's grade, um, say, a typical grade of a bolt uh, might be, say, grade 4.8 bolt, and its yield strength is 320 newtons per millimeter squared, and its ultimate strength is 400 newtons per millimeter squared. Um, whereas if I take a grade 8.8, its yield strength is 640 uh, kilonewtons per meter squared, and its ultimate strength is 800 kilonewtons per meter squared. But there's a very um, simple way of, of trying to remember what it is. If I look at the grade of the bolt, and if I take the uh, first number, multiply by the second number. So if I take the first number, multiply by the second number, I have 8, multiply by 8, and then uh, multiply by 10, 
that's equal to 640, okay? So that's the FYB. R is another way of doing it, is B divided by 10 multiplied by F, U, and B. And then if I want to get, so that, that gets me to work out what the uh, gain strength is. And then if I look at what the ultimate strength is, uh, the ultimate strength is always the, the ultimate strength is always the first number multiplied by 100. Okay, so multiply that by 100. And then I will get, um, I'll get 800 uh, down there. Okay, so you can see the same here. If I multiply the first number of 4.8 by 100, I get 400. If I multiply, I multiply the first number by the second number, multiply those two by each other, uh, I multiply by 10, I get 4 by 8 by 10. 4 is 32 and 10 is 320. Uh, so that's FYB. Okay. So once you uh, once you have that, it's very easy. So someone's asking, okay, you have a, a grade of a bolt of 8.8. .8. What's the yield strength? What's the ultimate strength? Well, I can tell you very quickly, 8.8 is 64. Add a 10 onto it. Uh, sorry, multiply by 10. That's 640 is the yield strength of it. Uh, take the first 8, multiply by 100. That's the ultimate strength. Okay. So 5 eighths is 40, multiply by 10, 400 for the yield strength. Uh, and then uh, and then take the 5 at the beginning, multiply by 100, that gives me 500 for the ultimate strength. Okay, so, that's, uh, so that tells us that's the classification of the ball to the grades of the balls uh, in there. And that comes from table 3.1. The next thing we need to consider about the spacing of the balls, the next thing we need to consider about the spacing of the balls are the, uh, the distances apart. One sec. Okay, sorry about that. So the next thing we need to consider is the bolt spacing um, in there. So we have to we need to choose a, goal, a bolt, uh, a grade of a bolt, like our steel members. We need to decide what grade it is. So what the, how strong the material is. That's the same with the bolts. We need to decide how strong they are. And then we also need to decide um, how we're going to space them out. And so again, um, if we go to figure 3.1 in Eurocode 3, part 1, part 8. So when you see a little uh, superscript here of 8, that means it's Eurocode 3, part 1, part 8. If you see a superscript of 5, it would mean Eurocode 3, part 1, part 5. And if you saw 1, it would be Eurocode 3, part 1, part 1. So that's just a shorthand that it is in the notes um, to determine or to indicate where we're getting uh, the figures from. So this is figure 3.1, Eurocode 3, part 1, part 8. Um, and we have the loading direction uh, here. So we're pulling this member to left to right. Um, so that's the loading direction. And then spacing here, so E2 is the edge spacing perpendicular to the load. E2 is the spacing um, between the members internally, um, which is called the gauge length. Uh, E1 is the distance from the edge of the plate to the first uh, bolt in the direction of loading, so in this one. Uh, then P1 is the pitch distance, so it's basically the distance between the bolts in the direction of loading or in there. So this is called a line of bolts in the direction of loading, and then it's called a row of bolts in the other direction. So if you hear a row, a row of bolts, that's the, the bolts. Uh, so the first row of bolts, second row of bolts, and so on. And then the line of bolts is the, in the direction of loading. Um, then when we go to table 3.3 in the same code, your code uh, 3, part 1, part 8, that gives us the maximum and minimum spacing that we uh, can use. Okay? So basically, this edge distance here is a minimum spacing, so we cannot have from the edge here to the center of the bolt, uh, cannot be any smaller than 1.2 times D0. And D0 uh, is the bolt um, diameter. Let's see if we can get that up here. D0 is the... Okay, so D naught here. Uh, D naught is the sorry, not the bolt diameter, bolt hole diameter. Okay, 
basically the hole that we drill into the steel plate um, to so that the bolt can pass through it. Sorry. Ah. One sec. Okay, so that's the uh, bolt. Bolt. Diameter. Okay, so D naught is the bolt hole diameter. So, um, so basically, uh, E uh, one has to be greater than or equal to 1.2 times D naught. Okay, but it also has to be less than or equal to four times T plus uh, 40 millimeters. Okay, so T down here is equal to the plate thickness. Okay, so so basically, in other words, um, so one point two times D naught, D one, four T plus four. Okay, so E one, the edge distance has to be somewhere between one point two D naught and four T plus forty. Right there, so that's. Uh, um, that that's one one constraint, and then there's lots of other ones that I'll show you in a second as well. Okay, so there's a dis, there's a, there's this different different values for all of those. Yeah, I'll show you the other ones. Uh, I'll bring up the table again when I'm doing the example. Okay, I mean, effectively table three point uh, three has got different uh, different values for the different um, uh, different distances for 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 the different uh, bolts. Sorry, I should have it on the um, I just don't have the code open up here. But I get the money. So I think it's two point four times the bolt diameter is the the whole diameter is for P P one. We we'll, we'll get that, and then E values E two and P two are very similar to E one and P one. I'll, I'll pull those up on on the table um, when we do the example. Okay. So when we're looking at these bolts, so we need to look at each of these individual bolts uh, in here. So this is a bolt. There's going to be bolts going through that hole. This is a bolt going through that hole there. We need to design that bolt. What do we need to do? We need to check uh, the bolts for different things. So we need to check shear failure of the bolt. Uh, okay, so we have to check that, that the bolt doesn't shear, fail in shear. So what does that look like? Is that the top of the bolt? So this is the bolt. It's gone through. And So what might happen then, we might end up getting a uh, shear right across uh, like that. Uh, so basically fracture right across it. So we might have then the, it's broken like this. Okay, so the bolt is sheared right across it. That could be a, that could be a failure that we have, a shear failure. Uh, so as we uh, you know, pull this across, it's, it's in, in a plate in here. Then we could shear off the bolt altogether where it just uh, rips off across the plate. Uh, bearing failure of the bolt in the plate. So what does that look like? So bearing failure. So if I look in plan, uh, bearing failure of the plate. Uh, so if I have the plate material here, the hole uh, in the end of it, like that. Um, and as I start, um, to, to try and move the plate out, then the, the bolt is starting to bear against the side here. It's starting to bear against the side, so it's putting a, a compression um, stress in against the side there, and eventually it might uh, it might fail it. That's the um, that's the plate that, that has bearing, but because the bolt is pushing against the plate, then therefore the plate is pushing against the bolt. Uh, so therefore you also have bearing in the in the bolt. So it could end up then that it fails because of uh, because of the bearing. A pressure associated associated with it. Okay, so so you could have uh, bolt bearing. Uh, you could have a plate bearing. Next thing is you could have tension failure of the bolt. Okay, so the top one here is because we're shearing it, so there's a, a shear force going back and over on it. So that's the shear force, shear failure. We have bearing, so tension. What might that look like? Uh, so tension of a bolt, so we have a, a, a bolt 
This is a bolt gone through here somewhere. And so, so there's a bolt here. Bolt in through here, trying to hold two two plates uh, together, and somehow then I'm uh, I'm pulling on those on those plates, so I'm pulling this plate this way, and I'm pulling the bolt head somewhere that way. Uh, then therefore the bolt isn't going to going to go into tension, okay, and it might fail in tension uh, in there. So normally as things fail in tension, I uh, will end up getting a the neck can happen of the bolt. And then it'll end up failing across through it. Okay, so we might have uh, some necking that might happen on the bolt uh, in the middle there, uh, and then it'll end up failing. Okay. Uh, connection plate buckling outside the scope of this course. So the plate that we're connecting to, so one of these plates here that we're connecting to, that might end up buckling uh, in there as well. Um, we also need to check neck cross section capacity so that's what we did um, when we're doing the tension member design where we have made a member going down through here and we have the different uh, bolt holes uh, in there we're trying to put a load on the end there and we said that we needed to check the uh, neck cross section area so we said we might need to check down through here with one cross section but also we might also need to check uh, through another cross section like down through here Okay, and then we have to get a net at one and two. Okay, so we did that as a as, a, as an example. We'll do we'll do more of that as we, when we come to um, project work because you're going to have to do this in the project work. We're going to have to look at the net cross section area. How you're going to connect it together? Okay, so that's the different types of um, bolted connections we had there. Let's see. Um. Okay, so let's go through those in a bit more detail of all the different checks that we have to do. So we have a uh, bolt shear check uh, in there. So we have to check this bolt for shear. Uh, so the bolt could shear in a, different, a few different places. It could sh shear here where the shank is. So this is the shank of the bolt. This is the root of the bolt uh, where, um, where the threads are. So these are the threads of the bolt. So you have the root of the bolt here, with the shank of the bolt uh, over here. Uh, and so we have to check what the resistance is um, for shear, for bolt shear, bearing, and tension. That's what we have to check. And then table 3.4 gives us uh, all of the um, equations that we need um, for that. So in, in clause 3.6.1 in Euro code 3, part 1, part 8, um, it has the shear bolt check. Okay, so we have the shear, so V, subscript V is the shear, RT is the resistance, um, and then so the resistance and shear is always going to be the shear stress times the cross-section area, okay? So the cross-section area, wherever the shear might happen, so either here or here, uh, we have the shear stress. So the shear stress is a factor times the um, axial strength, okay? And because we're allowed to have ultimate failure here, it could be... Um, non-ductile behavior we can use the ultimate strength of the bolt so we have a factor at uh, times the ultimate strength and if you remember back when we were designing and checking for shear uh, for our beam we said the shear strength so the yield shear strength is equal to the axial uh, uh, strength so stress axial stress divided by square root of three and that comes out to be 0 0.577 uh, sigma y in other words, the shear strength is about 60% that of this of the stress if we're uh, putting it into uh, axial load or tension. So if I got my sheet of paper, if you pull out a sheet of paper there out of an A4 pad, uh, and I catch the two ends of the sheet of paper and pull them apart, and try and rip the page, I will have a certain uh, stress in that page before it yields. Okay. If I took that same piece of paper and ripped it um, uh, sideways, like, like we normally tear something, it would take 60% less effort because um, it's 60% um, uh, less stress to be able to uh, uh, resistance shear or strength to be able to tear it in, in, in shear compared to be able to uh, make it fail in uh, by actually loading it. Okay, so therefore, this factor here uh, is going to be something around 0.6. Now, it depends on what we're going to use. So, if we use 
a grade 4.6 volts, 5.6 volts, or 8.8 .8 volts. Um, we're going to use 0 0.6, a value for, for that. Whereas if we use uh, other grades of volts, like 4.8, 10.9, we're going to use uh, 0.5 uh, in there. So why is there a different value? Let's just go back and look at the um, look at them. 4.8, so If we look at this uh, table here, if we look at 4.8 compared 4.6 compared to 4.8, you can see the difference between the yield strength and the ultimate strength uh, for 4.6 is 240 for the yield compared to 400 for the ultimate. There's 160 difference. But if we look at 4.8. The difference between the yield and the ultimate is very close okay 320 compared to 400. Okay. same thing if we compare say 8.8 .8 to 10.9 8.8 .8 is 640 compared to 800 so it's about 160 uh, of a difference from the yield to the ultimate strength whereas a 10.9 is only 900 compared to a thousand so in other words for some grades of, of uh, a board like for example uh, 4.8 uh, 5.8 and uh, 10.9 the yield um, and the ultimate are very close together. Okay, the yield strength and the ultimate are very close together. So that's taken into account then uh, in here. Let's say 4.8, 10.9, 5.8. Because the yield and the ultimate strengths are pretty close together, um, you want to be a little bit safer in terms of your design. Uh, so you use a factor of 0 0.5. Uh, whereas in uh, in the other ones where there's a bigger gap between the yield and the ultimate. Um, they're basically they're more ductile because the bigger gap between them. So if there's more ductile, uh, it won't it won't be as brittle failure won't fail as suddenly uh, as in the example of 4.8 and 10.9. So because it's more ductile, we're allowed to have a higher. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, and then if we're going to use the shank, um, if it's a shank area here, then we're allowed to use 0 0.6 as well. So that's one thing to just keep an eye out for. Another thing to keep an eye out for is the um, partial factor of safety. That partial factor of safety here is 1.25. So if you think of the other members that we were designing, we were designing members in tension and compression, and we used a value of one. Whereas in um, when we're talking about shear, because of the more variability in in uh, um, in nature of the property of material in shear, we therefore use a higher factor of safety because the bigger this number is at the bottom smaller your resistance is going to be so by increasing this up to uh, 1.25 in other words 25 percent higher the member loaded axially uh, then that's going to reduce down the force um to a smaller value okay so that's uh that's bold shear check okay uh, and then where do we get the values from so if we go to the blue book uh, and we pick out a bolt uh, out of the bolt out of the blue book uh, we can then find out what the area of the bolt is from the blue book okay and normally when we're designing for shear we use the area the cross-section area for the shear area uh, and in tension we're designing for tension we use the cross-section as being the area at the root typically sometimes we might have um, packing uh, in there so when we're putting two members together we might need to put some packing in there so in the uh, figure here on the right hand side we have a column that's kind of bigger on the bottom and a smaller one on the top and we want to connect them together connect the flanges together connect the webs together okay, and see these flanges because the outside of this one is further out than this one when we put a plate on the outside we have a gap in between it which is then filled with a packer plate which is the yellow plate in between uh, sometimes the same thing could happen with a beam a, a smaller beam into a bigger beam we need a packer plate and if we put a packer plate uh, in between these two that might affect its um, resistance so when we go to clause 6.3.6.1 uh, number 12 within your code 3 part 1 part 8 uh, we could end up having a, if we have a packer plate then we will add in an extra factor here which is a beta or subscript e for the packer plate that can't be any bigger than one because if it's a small if the thickness of the plate uh, divided by the bolt diameter is relatively small we could just ignore the packer plate and we have the full 100 percent capacity however as the thickness of the plate the packer plate starts to get bigger relative to the size of the board we have to reduce down um, the the capacity in in shear and that's reduced down by the factor beta p and beta p is nine times the diameter of the board all divided by eight times the diameter of the board plus three times the thickness of the packer plate um, in there okay 
And then that's then that's just taking the nine and putting it under the line. So if we put the underline, that's eight over nine plus one third at TP over D. So really, once we know the thickness of the anchor plate, the size of the balls we're going to use, we can work out the anchor value. Yeah. So we'll look at that in an example uh, later. Another thing we need to check in terms of the shear bolt check consideration is long joints. So in other words, if we have a lot of uh, um, a lot of connections together, so this is an example where we have a shear joint where we're pulling one plate up, another plate down, and we have all of these bolts, so lots of bolts uh, going across that joint, so N connectors going across the joint. We assume a shear distribution for rigid plates is uh, is even, in other words, it's the same shear stress in all of the bolts. However, because the joint is long, it may not be even, so you might actually have a distribution that looks more like this uh, for elastic plates in there. Okay, so if we have that, then we a long joint, then we have a, not a uniform a stress distribution all the way through the um, into the plate. We might have an, uh, a non-uniform stress distribution. So that's taken into account. So effectively, we have to work out if we have a long joint. We look at clause 3.8 part one uh, in there. If we have a long joint, then this part of the formula, alpha V, uh, F, U, B, A, um, gamma, M2, that's the shear strength of, a, of an individual bolt. We then have to change that, multiply that by a factor to take into account of the long joint, which is uh, beta LF. That factor, the smallest that factor can be is 0.75, because it can be a one. In other words, if we have a long joint, the capacity of a long joint is somewhere between 75% and 100% of a normal connection. Okay. Uh, and that uh, factor of the, of the long joint uh, that we use beta LF is equal to 1 minus LJ, LJ being the length of the joint, minus 15 times D, D being the diameter of the joint, 200 uh, D, D being the diameter. Okay, so basically the packing and long joint, we have them together, then we multiply, we have two beta factors in there. Okay, so the overall uh, shear strength of the bolt is equal to the shear strength of an individual bolt, multiplied by a beta factor taken into account that the long joint, Another beta factor take into account that there's some packing material in there. Okay, so that's shear check uh, for a bolt. And uh, then we also have to do some bearing checks for a bolt. So as I said, a shear, we're going to try and uh, basically slice off uh, the bolt from each other, whereas bearing that, that the bolt is pushing against the, the um, uh, or bearing or pushing against the plate, and the plate is pushing back against the bolt. And as a result of that, uh, we have to check in case that we might get bearing uh, failure in there. So bolt bearing resistance, FBRD, uh, is equal to this formula here. And this is given in clause 3.6.1. So it's, again, it's the same table that has all the formulas for the different checks for the for the bolts uh, in there. So there's a K1 value, there's an alpha beta B value, and then there's FU times DT. So if we just look at FU times DT, that's basically a stress, units per millimeter squared, times a cross-section area, because we have a bolt diameter and a thickness of the, of the plate. So that's... Uh, that's going to be a, a, so if we have plate in here. Okay, so we have a diameter for that, uh, the hole has a, has a certain diameter. The bolt that goes through the hole, sorry, the bolt has a certain diameter. So the bolt that goes through there. So let's draw the, so that bolt, D is equal to the bolt diameter. And then we have a plate thickness. Okay, so we have a, we have a bolt diameter, we have a plate thickness, that's an area. That's an area. So in other words, that's the area. So if I'm loading this, uh, okay. So that's a diameter. So that's an area. Um, so whatever the the take up the bolt. This is the bolt. So I basically said I've taken a an area, it's the diameter, times the thickness of the plate, and that's the area I'm taking. 
This is the O. Oh, okay, so we have a diameter for the bolt. And then we have a height here, which is the thickness of the plate. And that then is uh, that then is the area. Okay, so that's the area. And once we want to apply an area by a strength, so F U comes from table three point one. Okay, so that's the um, that's the ultimate strength. Sorry, it's not of the uh, not, not table three point one. That's the ultimate strength of that's uh, steel. Plate. Okay, so it's the ultimate strength of the steel plate. So Fu uh, is the ultimate strength of the steel plate. Gamma uh, M2 is just your material factor safety, which is 1.25. That's your partial safety factor. And then this alpha B value is really one of the key ones that we have to work out. Okay, so alpha B. So we can really concentrate for a second. This is the one that we, if we can get this right in our heads, then we're, we're going to be sorted for doing all these bearing checks. Okay. So if we look at what's in the red um, over here, so let's just try and concentrate on this and see if we can get it right. On the red here, we've got this, the strength of the plate, ultimate strength of the plate, multiplied by a cross-section area. Okay. So strength multiplied by cross-section area in newtons per millimeter squared multiplied by millimeter squared gives us a new. Okay, so that's a force. Okay. So that's the force, that's the resistance of that part of the bolt there in bearing. Therefore, if I put alpha B in there as one, uh, then what that, does that mean I'm checking? Well, that means I'm just checking uh, the bearing resistance of the plate, okay? So the, the cross-section of the plate here that's just in front of the bolt, um, that's, or just say behind, yeah, just behind in front of the bolt here, then we have a strength of the cross-section area, which is in Newtons, multiplied by alpha B, and if I make that one, what I'm doing here is I'm checking for um, plate bearing, okay? So if I have a one, I'm checking for plate bearing. So this one here means it's it's a plate bearing check that I'm doing. Now, what about in the formula, if I substitute in uh, alpha B here and put in uh, this factor in here. Okay, so if I put in that uh, in there, let's put that into the formula, then I would end up with F B or D is equal to K1. Instead of alpha B, I've got F U B all over F U. Uh, then I multiply that by F U with D times T as the formula, all over uh, alpha M2. So that gives me F B or uh, D is equal to K1. And then in this side of the formula here, I have an FU underneath, an FU on top, an FU underneath. So then I have uh, left with FUB times D times T all over gamma M2. Okay. So what does that tell me uh, in there? So now what have I got? I've got an FUB in here instead of an FU. The so FUB being the yield strength of the board. Sorry, the ultimate strength of the board. That's uh, ultimate strength of the board. Okay, so that's the ultimate strength of the board. So therefore, the second one here is basically what we're checking is bolt uh, bearing. Because okay. all we're doing uh, is taking alpha B, and instead of putting, uh, instead of well, and we, when we substitute in uh, the value here for alpha B, uh, this value here in for alpha B, all we'll end up with is FBRD is equal to K1 times the ultimate strength of the bolt times cross section. So really, all it is is just this formula at the top is a shorthand way of allowing us to check for plate bearing by putting one in there for alpha B, check for bolt bearing by putting in this factor for alpha B because the FU below the line cancels out with the FU above the line. 
So we just substitute FU for FUB, which is the strength of the bolt. Uh, so check for bolt bearing. And then the third thing that we can that we're using it for is we substitute instead of alpha B, put in alpha D. Okay, so alpha D and here, so alpha D uh, is is going to be um, for um, edge bearing. Okay, because what we're checking is we're going to check in the loading direction. So the direction we're loading, uh, E1 is the distance to the edge. Oh. So that's the, um, that's the hole diameter. And then the distance from the center of that hole, to the edge, that's E1. Okay, so we're checking. Um, this value here, alpha D, is equal to E1, uh, which is the distance from the bolt to the edge in the direction of loading. D0 is the um, diameter of the hole. Divided by, so E1 divided by 3 times D0. Um, that gives us what alpha D is um, for for the in bolts. Then if we have internal bolts, uh, alpha D is the pitch distance. So if we have more than one hole. So if, we, if we have another hole over there. Um, uh, in there, so and the distance between each of those is equal to P1. Uh, hold on one sec. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the pitch distance, distance between the two holes, uh, in the direction of loading. So if we have uh, to check the inner bolts, the pitch distance divided by three times the hole diameter minus one quarter. That gives us alpha D. Uh, and then depends on what that, uh, and then that pitch distance always has to be greater than and equal to 15 d naught divided by 4. Same thing E1 has to be greater than or equal to 3 times d naught. Okay? Otherwise there's, no, otherwise, there's no penalty um, in there. Okay, so that's uh, that's the um, bearing checks. Right, so the other thing that we have in that formula for the bearing checks is K1, the factor K1. Okay, so we talked about uh, what alpha B means. Basically, if we put in alpha B is equal to 1, uh, we're checking for play bearing. If uh, alpha B is equal to um, FUB over FU, we're talking about um, a bolt bearing. And if we, alpha uh, B is equal to alpha D, then that's the edge bearing. And then we take the alpha B is equal to the minimum of the three of those. So in other words, whichever is the smallest of three of those, that's the type of failure that's going to happen first. So for example, if, if alpha uh, B is determined by one, that means plate bearing is going to happen before you get bolt bearing, before you get edge bearing. However, if uh, alpha B ends up being the, um, um, equal to FUB over F, FU, because that's the smallest value of the three of these, then that means that bolt bearing is going to happen first. Or if alpha B equals to alpha D, because that's the smallest value, then it's edge bearing is going to happen first. So whichever these three are smallest, that's the type of failure that's going to happen first. Okay, and then the last uh, thing we need to plug in there is K1. Uh, so K1 value um, is this factor here uh, in there. So we have, um, two, yeah. okay, so uh, so one is, so this is, we said that this is edge distance, just drawing the, yeah, yeah, one sec. So this is the edge distance, E1. Uh, then we said this is the pitch distance, P1. This is the edge distance uh, perpendicular to the loading, E2. And this is the gauge distance, uh, P2. Um, so that's the, 
Yeah. Okay, so K1 uh, in this form right here. Uh, K1 is equal to 2.8 times uh, E2. E2 is the uh, edge distance perpendicular to the loading direction, uh, D0 being the, the bolt uh, uh, hole diameter, uh, minus 1.5, 1.7. That has to be less than 2.5 for the edge bolts. Uh, and if it's an internal bolt, then we would use this formula where P2 is equal to the um, pitch distance. In other words, the distance between the, sorry, the gauge distance, distance between the bolts that are, it's a perpendicular to loading direction because we're loading it uh, left to right here. Uh, D naught is equal to the whole diameter. Okay, so that's the bearing checks. That's all summarized in this table here. So everything we wrote there, it's all in one table. So we go to Eurocode 3, part 1, part 8. We go to table 3.4. And all of that is in one table. So we have the shear resistance is alpha V uh, times the ultimate strength of the bolt times the cross section area of the bolt divided by the material partial factor safety, which is 1.25. It tells us that a, a alpha V is 0.6 for these grade bolts, 0.5 for these grade bolts. Um, and it tells us uh, where the shear plane passes to the untreaded part of the bolt, A is a gross cross section area. Uh, where if it passes through the treaded portion of the bolt, uh, A is equal to the tensile area. Okay, so that's uh, that just depends on what part of the bolt we have. So if that's the bolt uh, in there. Okay, so we have a treaded part down here. So if we're true, uh, so A is the tensile strength of it if we're true here. So so here we use AT. So A is equal to AT in that case. Um, if um, if we're looking at a shear plane through there, whereas if we're looking at a shear plane uh, through here, so let's say through here, and then A is equal to the full cross-section area. Okay. So that's the... Um, uh, that's the shear resistance um, per, per shear plane. That's for bolts, rivets we're not going to cover in this uh, course, but uh, rivets uh, is over there. Similar formula. Bearing resistance we just covered. Uh, K1, alpha B, F, U, D, T. Uh, in there, as I said, if you put alpha B, if it's equal to 1, it's um, plate bearing. If you put uh, alpha B, it's F, U, over, F, U, B over F, U. It's uh, bolt bearing. Uh, if you put alpha uh, B is equal to alpha D, it's going to be edge bearing. And whichever is the smallest of those three, is it edge bearing, is it a bolt bearing, or is it plate bearing, whichever is the smallest one means that that's what the failure is going to happen uh, first. In there, And then we have the formulas, as I went through, for alpha D, uh, and the formulas for K1. So K1 being the smallest of this value, or 2.5, so it can't be any larger than 2.5. K1 here is this value, or 2.5. And, two and, a half. and then that's, uh, so that's a number if it's in um, shear, number in bearing, and then if we have a a bolt in tension that we're trying to pull apart in tension. Then the tension resistance equal to K2 times the ultimate uh, strength of the bolt times the cross section uh, area of the bolt, all divided by the material factor safety or the partial uh, factor, 1.25. Uh, and then K2, if it's a countersunk bolt, it's 0.63. If it's a normal bolt, it's 0.9. So typically we use 0.9, but for some reason, if we have a countersunk bolt, which we would often use, uh, for various different reasons. So if I have a plate, I might uh, take a, so if that's the plate, I might end up with, um, up, up. ah, sorry. Okay, okay so this is, my, this is my plate. And then I might end up with a bolt uh, that could sit in here. Okay, and there'll be a, a nut on the end of the bolt on the other side. Okay, so it's countersunk here. Okay, yeah, so I've taken a, you know, taken a bit of the uh, plate here, uh, and I have um, 
the head of the bolt sits down inside the plate because it might be that I'm connecting something. Maybe I'm connect, connecting something together with it. Uh, on top, I want to put something else on top, and I don't want this to be sitting up on, on top, so I counter it and get it uh, underneath it because I might have some other plate maybe sitting on top here, or I might want to put a finish on it or so on in there. So I might counter sink uh, the top of it in there. If I do that, uh, then tension resistance is less. So instead of using a typical 0.9 value uh, in the um, for the tension resistance, in other words, we're saying look, we know what the ultimate uh, strength of the bolt is, we know what the cross section area is. That's really what the force you could put on the bolt before it fails. But because uh, it's a, it's a non-ductile type uh, failure, we're going to reduce down that capacity by 90%. In other words, multiply by 0.9. And also because the scatter or uncertainty in terms of the in terms of the strengths, we're going to 1.25 below the line. So we have 0.9 above it, 1.25 below it. Uh, so that's all reducing down uh, the capacity of the bolt. And then because of the countersunk, that's even more risk associated with it. Uh, we're going to make it 0.63 in there in terms of its in terms of its capacity. So two more things that we need to consider for uh, for our bolts. Um, if we have a group of bolts um, together, then we need to say, well, up to now we've been looking at each individual bolt, and we're looking at what the um, whether it uh, is which is the which is the most um, what do we need to design for. Well, we're going to check it for shear. We're going to check it for um, plate bearing, bolt bearing. An in bearing, and then the capacity of the bolt to carry the load is whichever is the smallest. So either the shear or the bearing, depends which of these three are, are, are the smallest. So that's what's going to tell us is the capacity of the bolt. Is it going to fail in a bearing, a plate bearing, a bolt bearing, or in bearing, or fail in shear first? So whichever of these are smaller, uh, that's the way it's going to fail first. Or we might, that's just an individual bolt that we calculate those capacities for, but we can have a group of bolts. So we can have in one connection. Uh, we can have a whole group of bolts in there, so we have a, a whole heap of bolts here at the end of our, our uh, steel. So we'll put a whole heap of bolts here at the end of the steel. Okay, so we have all these bolts uh, in through. That's a group of, of bolts. Uh, what's the resistance of the overall connection? Okay, so that's what we want to do because we're looking at the resistance of the overall connection. So the resistance of the overall connection is going to be some sort of combination of the resistance of each of these individual bolts. Um, so the design resistance of a group of bolts uh, is equal to the sum of the bearing resistance of all the bolts. So if we take each of these bolts, we've worked out what the bearing resistance is from here, from uh, table 3.4. And then we work out that the total resistance of that connection is equal to the sum of the bearing resistance of each of the individual eight bolts in this example. If the shear strength of the, the shear resistance of the bolt is greater than the um, bearing resistance for all the bolts. In other words, when I check this shear, that value for a bolt, for every individual bolt, is higher than the, than the bearing, then it's very simple. That means that it's stronger in shear, every individual bolt is stronger in shear than it is in bearing. Therefore, the total resistance of the group of bolts is just the sum of all those bearing resistance. Otherwise, what we have to do is we have to look at each individual bolt and we have to see what's the resistance because it could turn out that actually you know, this bolt here at the end, it could be in bearing, uh, is the smallest one for that one, it could be in bearing for this one, it could be um, plate bearing for this one, and it could be a uh, shear for another one. So we have to look at all the individual bolts, and the design is equal to the number of bolts multiplied by the minimum of uh, the shear resistance and the, mi the minimum of the shear resistance, and then the minimum of the bearing resistance for each individual bolt. Okay, so where FBRD uh, is the bearing resistance of an individual bolt, FBRD is the design resistance of an individual bolt, and NB is the number of bolts. In this example, NB is 8. And that's uh, specified in, in clause 3.7 uh, in, in Eurocode 3, part 1, uh, part 8. So design resistance of a group of fasteners may be taken as the sum of design resistances of the individual fasteners, provided that the design shear resistance of each individual fastener is greater or equal to the design bearing resistance F. BRD. Otherwise, design resistance of a group of fasteners should be taken as the number of fasteners multiplied by the smallest design resistance of any individual fastener. In there. So that's the um, that's the theory um, for for all of this. Um, that's the um, um, that's what we're going to design for, uh, and then uh, for, for bolts, then I'm going to follow on from that from doing a um, couple of design examples. So I'll do uh, one design example uh, now. Maybe take a break for um, 
about seven or eight minutes and then we'll do one design example just to put that into practice. Yeah.